This episode has been brought to you by irishnewspaperarchives.com, the gateway to Ireland's great historical past. irishnewspaperarchives.com is one of the essential online resources for anyone interested in Irish history or genealogy. With over 6 million pages from 75 newspapers dating back to the 18th century, this is an incredible insight into the world of our ancestors. Better still, you need no experience to use it. Just sign up and type whatever you're looking for into their search bar and it'll do all the research for you. If you sign up today as a listener of the Irish History Podcast, you can get 30% off monthly and yearly packages. This is an opportunity not to be missed. So go now to irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and use the coupon code POD30. That URL is irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and the coupon code is POD30. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is The Famine Irish in Britain. This is the last of several episodes that follows the story of Irish famine emigrants and today we look at those who ended up in Britain in the 1850s and 60s. Their story is very different from the experience of those in the USA. Economic recession and a very different political system stripped them of the opportunities that America offered. It is impossible to encapsulate the varied experiences of an entire generation in one show, so instead I decided to focus on one man, the Antrim native John Thompson, who, like hundreds of thousands, settled in Britain after the Great Famine. While his story is somewhat unusual, he would spend decades in the British Army, then prisons and asylums, it highlights issues all too familiar to many of that post-famine generation living in Britain. Before we get into this fascinating and intriguing story, I want to begin by thanking the patrons who support this show on a regular basis. Patrons are listeners who donate to support the show at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. If you become a patron, you will get access to exclusive episode guides, patrons-only podcasts, and my upcoming documentary film, which will be released over the summer. And of course, you also get a shout-out in the show. This week, I want to thank John Looney, Bob Becker, Henrik Forsberg, Philip Doyle, Kevin Costello, Jerry Lavin, Tony Cullen, Rosemary Ryan, Alistair Funge, and M. Gray. Thanks a million for all your support. I really appreciate it. If you want to become a patron, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Born in Antrim Town in 1837, near the shores of Loch Ney outside Belfast, John Thompson would have belonged to what might be called Generation Famine had modern naming conventions existed. There is no question that the experiences of the Great Hunger in the late 1840s haunted him and his contemporaries for the rest of their lives. While many of his generation, particularly those who remained in Ireland, were reticent to talk about the horrors they had endured, it permanently overshadowed their lives, like an unmentioned spectre shaping how they interacted with the world around them and indeed how others, particularly those overseas, viewed them. This is hardly surprising. We would struggle to find a single family in Ireland in the 1850s who were not impacted by the death, social dislocation and trauma the Great Famine had inflicted on the Irish people. For John Thompson in Antrim, he probably did escape the worst. The extreme horrors such as starving people, unburied bodies, orphaned children crying for parents, which had been the hallmarks of daily existence in places like Skibbereen. The hardships endured by the people of Antrim, like John Thompson, had never reached these extremes. While I have yet to cover the story of the famine in Ulster, most of the east of the province at least was less severely affected than say the far west of Ireland. This doesn't mean though that John Thompson did not suffer at all. No community in Ireland escaped and the census statistics taken in 1851 hint at a painful story in John's home parish of Antrim. The population had in fact fallen by 10% and this seems to have hit the poorest disproportionately. 
In the absence of a more detailed account, we can deduce from the 1851 statistics that the numbers of families living in fourth class housing, basically one-roomed mud cabins, had fallen dramatically from 29% to just 2%. Now ostensibly you might think this was a positive development, housing standards were improving. However, we also have to ask, what happened to the people who had once lived in these cabins? The most likely scenario is that large-scale evictions and emigration saw them scoured from the land. John Thompson was aged about 14 when the famine came to an end in the early 1850s and was among the millions of survivors haunted by his experiences. For those survivors like John, the post-famine world must have been a strange place. The memories of a people scattered were everywhere. Whether his former friends had gone to Belfast or Boston, places like Antrim would never be the same again. The broken down ruins of houses and the crushing silence where once laughter had echoed must have been a constant torment. Indeed, even the end of the famine did not stem the population decline. In the 1850s, Friedrich Engels, when travelling through Ireland, would write to Karl Marx describing parts of the West as an utter desert desert which which nobody nobody wants. wants. While this was an exaggeration perhaps, and the situation was by no means as serious in Ulster, it did reflect the hardships of life in Ireland after the famine for the poor. Emigration remained high. 1852 would prove to be the worst year in terms of emigration in Irish history when nearly 370,000 people left the island. In the later 1850s, when he was 20 years of age, John Thompson finally decided the time had come for him to leave too. He departed his home in Antrim town and on October the 19th, 1857, he walked into an army barracks in nearby Belfast and signed up. The British army had long recruited large numbers of Irish men, attracted by what was steady work and a means of evading the life of poverty that awaited them at home. However, while regular pay may have been enticing to the likes of John Thompson, who was a labourer and had few prospects, he wasn't cut out for the discipline army life demanded. His military career was short-lived and an utter disaster. It was distinguished in only one aspect, its brevity. Having signed up on October the 19th, Thompson had gone AWOL within 16 days. He returned to the barracks six days later where he was severely reprimanded and imprisoned for nearly one month, eventually being released in early January 1858. His punishment, however, had no impact in terms of instilling discipline and John Thompson quickly tired of army life. Eight days after his release from his initial imprisonment after going AWOL, he deserted again on January the 16th. Turning up a week later, he was tried, convicted and imprisoned, now for the second time. However, his sentence on this occasion was nearly three months. Released on April the 16th, he had now spent six months in the army and over half this time had been in a prison cell after going AWOL. By July, it would appear his superiors had decided Thompson would never become an army man. He was discharged on July 26, 1858, bringing his military career of 280 days to an end. The reason cited on his discharge papers was chronic bronchitis, but one suspects by this point the army were keen to rid themselves of a man whose character and conduct they described as bad. His dismissal ended what was one of the best chances John had to escape the poverty that life in post-famine Ireland inflicted on people. Over the following two years, there was no trace of John until a man of the same age, from Ireland, with a military past, turned up in England. Judging on British Army records, this is the same John Thompson, as no other soldier fits the profile. In late 1861, having successfully made his way to England, Thompson travelled to the port of Liverpool where many Irish emigrants, no matter where they were heading, passed through at one time or another. Here, however, the poverty he was presumably hoping to leave behind in Ireland followed him. Perhaps John had plans to follow most of his fellow Irish people on to the USA, but he would never make it, instead becoming trapped in what were the notorious slums along the Mersey River where Irish people lived in appalling conditions. Miserable as these living conditions were, when John Thompson arrived in Liverpool after his discharge from the army, he must have found it a strangely familiar place. There was no question the bustling city was very different from his life back on the shores of Loch Ney in Ireland. 
the entire population of Antrim Town was 2,700 in 1851, while Liverpool was home to over 375,000 people. Nevertheless, it can only have had a familiar feel as the city was thronged with fellow Irish people. Even before the famine in 1844, the philosopher and economist Friedrich Engels had commented on how he had heard Irish being spoken in the streets of, of the nearby city of Manchester. After the famine in the late 1850s, the Irish community in Liverpool were inescapable in the city streets. In the surrounding region of Lancashire, their numbers had doubled during the 1840s and they concentrated in Liverpool, where they accounted for 22% of the population. In Britain, as a whole, the Irish-born population had nearly doubled after the famine, from around 420,000 in 1841 to 806,000 in 1861. However, while John Thompson may have felt eerily at home, he was still poor and down on luck and short of money. So he turned to crime. On November the 5th, 1861, he went to a pub on Atkinson Street in Liverpool with two other men and began drinking with Thomas Woodward, the man who owned the establishment. After a while, the two went to Woodward's home where they said they played games and continued to drink before eventually returning to the pub. It seems they may have been gambling because at the end of the evening John Thompson believed Woodward owed him money. When Woodward refused to pay up, John Thompson physically assaulted him. Finding over two pounds on the publican, he stole it. Arrested shortly afterwards, he was hauled before a court and charged with theft. He turned up to his trial wearing a military uniform, perhaps in an attempt to invoke sympathy from the judge. It didn't work. He was found guilty and while the reports and records are contradictory, he received somewhere between a few months and a few years in prison. Aged about 25 at this stage, John Thompson now began what became an odyssey in various institutions in England, a journey where the Great Famine and the experiences he and other Irish people had endured were never far behind him. Before we look at this, I want to take a quick break. Hi folks and thanks for taking time to download the show. This episode is brought to you by irishnewspaperarchives.com, the gateway to Ireland's great historical past. Access to this archive is a must-have for anyone interested in Irish history and genealogy. I use it all the time myself. It has over 6 million scans of Irish newspapers from 75 different titles dating all the way back to 1738. So if you're interested in the major historical events or just tracing your ancestors, this is the perfect resource. It's really easy to use. You can type in a search word into the search engine and it does all the hard work and within seconds returns all the newspaper articles mentioning the topic you're looking for. If you sign up today as a listener to the Irish History Podcast, you can get 30%. That's a full 30% off monthly and yearly packages. This is an opportunity not to be missed, so go to irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and use the coupon code POD30. Don't miss out, it's irishnewspaperarchives.com forward slash podcast and that coupon code is POD30. With such a common name, following our John Thompson's individual records, in prisons is difficult and I couldn't find out what jail he served his sentence. However, at some point he began to display what were deemed symptoms of poor mental health. By the late 1860s he was in the Fisherton Asylum in Wiltshire. In 1868 he had been transferred to the notorious Broadmoor Asylum which had just opened. Because his files are held in archives in England I wasn't able to ascertain what exactly John's condition was, but one article does reference the fact that he was prone to violent outbursts. After a few months in Broadmoor, John was moved again. This time he was returned to Lancashire, close to the scene of his original crime in the city of Liverpool. There he was incarcerated in the Rainhill Asylum, just outside the city, where his mental illness appears to have improved somewhat. In 1873, long after his original crime, he was still in the asylum system where he was transferred to the Whittingham Asylum, another newly opened institution in Lancashire designed to hold over a thousand people. These asylums were not pleasant in any way, shape or form. Like all Victorian institutions, they were dangerous places 
The people incarcerated in them ranged from those who struggled to adapt to wider society, all the way up to people with very serious mental conditions. Although originally established with the hope of curing patients, asylums by this stage had basically become prisons. With an extraordinary definition of what a mental illness was, they had very quickly become overcrowded and the ideas of curing patients had simply given way to incarcerating them and this, as I say, more like prison system emerged. I've not been able to find out where John Thompson would eventually end up, but by the early 1870s, although he was only in his 30s, he had already spent one third of his life in English institutions, all starting from that one night in 1861 when he stole two pounds. When John Thompson died is unclear, but his life story is very instructive in my opinion as to the wider experience of the famine Irish in Britain in the decades following the Great Hunger. While most would never enter asylums, the experiences of those who did highlight prejudices and experiences that were all too familiar to the wider Irish population. This can be best explained by returning to the story of John Thompson when he was transferred from the Broadmoor Asylum to the Rain Hill Asylum in Liverpool. Just like when he had initially come to the city of Liverpool, when John Thompson was transferred from Broadmoor Asylum to Rain Hill Asylum outside the city in 1868, the institution probably gave him a familiar feel. Situated just 10 miles west of Liverpool, most of its patients, or perhaps inmates is a better word to describe their fate, were drawn from the city itself. However, even though Liverpool had a huge Irish population, they were still disproportionately represented in the asylum. By the late 1850s, of all admissions to Rain Hill, 50% of them were Irish, despite the fact the Irish only accounted for just over 20% of the population. Therefore, Irish people were twice as likely as most other groups to be considered mentally unwell. Through the late 1860s, the number of new admissions into the Rain Hill Asylum were around 150 per year, and of these, 50 were consistently Irish. While these numbers may appear relatively low, they're not insignificant. It's worth bearing in mind that Rainhill was the smaller of four Lancashire asylums, so the overall numbers were considerable and undoubtedly ran into the thousands over the course of the decades that followed the famine. Furthermore, as we will see, this also reflected on the wider position of the Irish living in Britain after the famine. But before we go into that, I want to look at some of the reasons why people like John Thompson were being institutionalised in asylums because I think this cuts to the heart of the matter. The reasons why the Irish were so heavily institutionalised in Britain has been the study of a lot of research over the last few decades. Many historians have focused on the structural reasons which are very important and I will come to but first I want to look at an issue that must have played a role but is very difficult to quantify. That is, the mental strain that the famine took on Irish people in general. Throughout this series, I have chronicled the horrors the Great Famine inflicted on people. While most were touched by death, the accounts of dogs unearthing bodies, parents taking food from their own children, and indeed the horrors of workhouses, created lasting, unforgettable and distressing memories for the survivors. That this was a deeply traumatic event is unquestionable. Indeed, there's good evidence Irish society and people were in a collective state of shock afterwards. A shroud of silence descended over the entire event, which was often referred to just as Androchel, meaning the bad life or bad times, by many who had lived through the worst of these hardships. If this happened today, I think we would talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Therefore, I think it's safe to say that certainly many of those who had pre-existing mental illnesses were under immense strain by the 1850s. This was coupled with other very real problems the Irish famine emigrants faced in Britain. Most wanted to travel to America. In crude terms, Britain was in many ways becoming a sieve holding back those in the worst poverty. They had managed to escape Ireland but couldn't get the money together to travel on to the USA. Indeed, at Rain Hill Asylum, one of the doctors believed this anguish at living somewhere they didn't want to be was contributing to the high rates of mental illness. In his words, they were, and I quote, crushed by disappointment in a foreign land. This was coupled and exacerbated by the dire conditions in which these people had to live. 
I have in previous shows recounted numerous stories of disturbing living conditions in the 19th century, so it suffices to say that the slums of Liverpool could match the worst in Dublin, Quebec or New York. Dr John Cleeton, a medical superintendent in Rain Hill, said of his patients that they were shattered in bodily health and condition from poverty, dissipation and other noxious influences incidental to large towns. However, of all these factors, we must acknowledge the experience of the famine was the only one truly unique to Irish people, and I don't think we can say it explains how a minority who accounted for about 20% of the population of Liverpool made up 50% of admissions to mental asylums. There were other forces at work which related more to the overall position of the Irish in wider society in Britain and how they were viewed. The first of these was poverty, something that brought the Irish into contact with the authorities and saw them sent to institutions. As I said earlier, the Irish, living in Liverpool, were frequently the most desperate emigrants, those who, by one way or another, had gotten the money needed to cross to England but couldn't save enough to reach America. That they were poor and destitute is just borne out in statistics. In terms of numbers, by the final days of 1846, there were over 13,000 Irish people receiving poor relief in Liverpool, an astronomical increase given the figure had only been 900 people a year earlier. Between 1846 and 1854, over 30% of all money being spent on the poor in Liverpool, which amounted to over £100,000, was spent on Irish people. It was this poverty and desperation that guaranteed the Irish were more likely to come into contact with the authorities and subsequently find themselves on a path towards institutionalisation. The first path was like that of John Thompson, through crime, courts and ultimately prison. Indeed, in 1849, for example, the Irish were accounting for 40% of prison numbers in some jails in Liverpool. Many were convicted of no more than vagrancy or homelessness, which was a crime. This, however, exposed them to examination from prison doctors who could have sent them to asylums. They were also, disproportionately, coming into contact with authorities in the city workhouses, as this was where many took refuge, and indeed it was workhouses which were the most common path by which people entered asylums. In the late 1860s, the workhouse provided two-thirds of all Irish admissions to asylums. While poverty brought Irish people into contact with authorities more frequently than any other group, perhaps, there was another, probably more important, underlying reason why so many Irish people found themselves in asylums. This was something that haunts the Irish experience in England right up to the present day, that is, racism. On the eve of the famine, most large British cities already had substantial Irish populations who had long faced hostility from wider society. They were in general seen as something as outsiders, subversive and uncivilised by nature. In what is a now relatively well-known account by the German philosopher Friedrich Engels, best known as one of the founding fathers of communism, he gave voice to what were pretty common attitudes towards Irish people in England prior to the famine. These people, having grown up almost without civilization, accustomed from youth to every sort of privation, rough, intemperate and improvident, bring all their brutal habits with them among a class of the English population which has, in truth, little inducement to cultivate education and morality. Engels, by no means the most racist of his contemporaries, continued this bigoted sentiment. These Irish men who migrate for fourpence to England on the deck of a steamship on which they are often packed like cattle insinuate themselves everywhere. The worst dwellings are good enough for them. Their clothing causes them little trouble so long as it holds together by a single thread. Shoes they know not. Their food consists of potatoes and potatoes only. Whatever they earn beyond these needs, they spend upon drink. What does such a race want with high wages? The Irishman loves his pig as an Arab loves his horse, with the difference that he sells it when it is fat enough to kill. Otherwise, he eats and sleeps with it. His children play with it, ride upon it, roll in the dirt with it, as anyone may see a thousand times repeated in all the great towns of England. Engel's primary concern was that the poor Irish moving to England were being used to undercut wages amongst England's industrial working class, but his account betrays what were commonly held racialised views of Irish people in Britain before 1845. This tract went on to make allusions to the widely held belief that Irish people were prone to mental illness. Similar sentiments 
would develop into a stereotype that portrayed the Irish as being more in need of institutionalisation than other groups in society. These caricatures and stereotypes towards Irish people in Britain had didn't emerge though in the 19th century. They were built on centuries of racism, which portrayed the Irish as primitive and backward. Indeed, by the 19th century, it could be said that British national identity was, in part at least, formed by a distrust and opposition to Irish Catholics in particular. The arrival of large numbers of destitute Catholics after 1845, many on the verge of starvation, carrying disease in some cases, if anything, only hardened these sentiments and influenced the high levels of people being sent to institutions such as asylums. These stereotypes were visible at Rain Hill, for example, where John Thompson ended up in the 1870s, along with many other Irish people. A few years earlier, in the 1860s, a medic had described the character of a large proportion of the patients in this asylum being drawn from the Irish quarters in Liverpool is intrinsically bad in their mental condition such as to afford no hope whatever of ultimate recovery. This view that the Irish were prone to insanity also had consequences as they struggled to secure a release from asylums as some at least felt they could not be cured. Ultimately, this racism, along with the extreme trauma the famine had inflicted, and the fact that they were more likely to interact with the authorities led the Irish in Britain to find themselves in asylums more than any other group at the time. However, before we finish, I think it's really important to put what I've said now into some context in terms of wider society. The experience of the Irish who were institutionalised in asylums is only one aspect of the story of the Irish in Britain after the famine. Those who found themselves in asylums were a small minority, but their experience does reflect some of the hardships that their generation, who were haunted by the famine, endured in Britain. It's also important to acknowledge that the racism they faced was not unique to Britain. For example, in the episode on the famine Irish in the USA, we saw how they also faced major prejudices there. However, the dynamics of British society did intensify the impact of this racism, in my opinion. Firstly, the US economy, while it would fall into recession, offered more opportunities than Britain did. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly though, the Irish in places like New York found a vehicle to defend and advance their interests in the Democratic Party. In Britain, the famine Irish had no similar political organisation to rally around. Indeed, given they were largely poor, they, like all working class people, were unable to vote, and this would remain the case for decades. This ensured that no political party, liberal or conservative, was particularly interested in their welfare, a situation that would see these racist attitudes go largely untackled for decades to come. This podcast has by no means been a complete history. It has focused on a very narrow lens of the Irish in asylums, but I hope it has shone a light on some of the wider issues that that generation faced in Britain. This is the last episode on the story of emigration during the Great Famine. I'm taking a week's holidays next week, so the next show will be out a bit late. But then, when I return, we'll be looking at what was happening in Ireland in 1848, when tensions brewing resulted in the 1848 rebellion. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>